Well, good morning, everybody. Um, just thought I'd do a, a quick update on where we're at with playing around with this uh, radio here. Um, at this stage, uh, it's been converted into a single conversion superhead. Um, and just very quickly, we've got uh, our RF coming in through here, through the RF amp. That's the amp that we looked at the other day in the previous video. It's now going through, and at the moment the radio is just playing around with 20 meters. It's going through a 20 meter bandpass filter, which we can look at at a later date, into our mixer. Um, as we previously mentioned, we're using the SI5351 to generate both our VFO and our BFO. So through the mixer, through a diplexer, um, having a play around with a diplexer here to essentially, excuse the fan here and the power supply, um, to ensure that the mixer here has essentially a 50 ohm load for the various frequencies coming out. So not only our desired IF, but also the other frequencies. So we've got a diplexer there, which we'll look at at a later date. Um, through the first IF amplifier, the configuration of that amp is the same as this one, but rather than having a user variable control, it's a, uh, it's a trim pot. The output of uh, that mixer is then going through our homebrew crystal filter. Um, obviously with the impedance matching here which we'll look at later this is just an update uh, video and then back through a second IF amplifier this one here is configured uh, eventually for AGC at the moment it's just a, a user controlled pot but that red line there will be eventually uh, the AGC line coming in out of that mixer into our product detector and audio coming out um, and what we'll look at today is just basically uh, what I had to do to configure the VFO and the beat frequency oscillator to align our desired sideband, in this case for 20 meters, the upper sideband to be within the pass band of our crystal filter. So what I did there, let's get this look here, hopefully we can look at that. Um, so in terms of the frequency domain, there goes our 20 meter signal up there, up at 14 megs with our upper sideband. Uh, and we'll look at it in a sec. Um, and the way it's going to be configured, it'd be the VFO down here and our beat frequency oscillator sitting here. So, what I did for a start is I needed to place as a starting point the beat frequency oscillator signal roughly 300 hertz beyond the 3 dB point. So, um, I had another, had, look, had another look at the uh, the filter. Its center frequency is, is pretty close to. Um, 8001250 with a bandwidth of 1900 hertz. So I started with the center frequency stepping backwards half its width and then another 300 again as a starting point 8 megs. And that's what you'll see down here. So for the beat frequency oscillator it's 8 megs. For the variable frequency oscillator um, in order not to get uh, in a sideband inversion, I elected to go with uh, the difference, so the, the variable frequency will equal the frequency of operation minus the beat frequency. So if we were to choose, say for example, 14.1 megahertz, our variable frequency loss that will be 14.1 minus 8 equals 6100. And that's what we see depicted there. Uh, later on, when we convert this into the proper code, what we'll display here is simply the variable frequency plus the beat frequency, and that will display 14.1. But this is purely for just configuring um, the constant, so to speak, uh, which we can then feed back into the code and update it. For 80 meters, um, I've just switched the BFO and the frequency around in the equation. So still sticking with the same BFO of 8 megs, in this case, minus 3700, uh, sort of roughly center of the 80 meter band, gives 4300. Um, which is good because 4300 is certainly outside our pass band. It's, it's getting quite close to the upper end of 80 meters, and we'll have a bit of a play with that. But my experiments before it was fine, and I certainly wasn't getting any interference coming through. Um, and 6.1 is certainly for the VFO for 20 meters. Um, 
is fine. That's that's well and truly outside the pass band of uh, our band pass filters. So in terms of just having a bit of a play here, what I've done, oh, I think it's that fan again. The, the old power supply here is getting a bit warm in this room. Uh, we've got a little radio here sitting on 14.1 megs. Um, I'm going to key it. Got a, got a little uh, MP3 player there, so that's just sending some audio into the radio, and it's just being dumped through a very, a very simple little um, dummy load there. Very, very low power, so you know, nothing's getting warm there. It's just, just enough to get a bit of a signal out. Um, that's enough to get into our RF. Um, the RF amp's off, and uh, we're getting that coming through. So. So those initial calculations were pretty good actually and if I wanted to sort of tinker around with that I could go down here to the beat frequency and I can sort of play around with where that beat frequency is and I could also play around with um, keeping the beat frequency constant, the variable frequency to then shift that now transposed sideband uh, in and around uh, the pass bend of the crystal filter. And what that also allowed me to do is just to basically make sure that if I went to lower side bend on the radio that I wasn't getting anything coming through. Um, so I know that I've got the the um, I know I've got the oh, I haven't drawn it here very well the beat frequency sufficiently off or down the skirts of the pass band to make sure that uh, the other side band is not getting through. So um, that's where we can find the back upper side band. So that's audio. Um, that's uh, that's actually not too bad. And I acknowledge that the uh, the pass band of this is only 1900, so it's not overly wide, but that's that's not too bad. Um, just a couple of things of interest, or maybe of interest. Let me just zoom up across over to here. This second amplifier here, um, I was looking through the EMRFD book, and what's quite interesting, with this amplifier over here, even with, in the current configuration, the source resistor for the first J310 is coming straight off Earth. So even if you apply zero volts to the gate two of the second JFET, you still get current coming through. Um, you increase that voltage up to you know, approximately a third um, of VCC, and you start to get max gain coming through. So yes, you get some reasonably good gain variation, but you can't really shut that amplifier off. Over here, it's a subtle difference. Um, what we've done, and apologies for moving the camera there, uh, you might be able to see four, I tried three then I went to four in the end, four little 4148 diodes um, in series and the, the, the first one's coming off earth and then the very last one is providing, so it's going to be one, two, three, four, seven fours of 28, so approximately 2.8 odd uh, volts is now sitting at the base of that first source resistor. So whereas this one over here was at Earth. This one here is now sitting up at around 2.7 volts. What that means is when the AGC drive or voltage coming in on gate 2 of this JFET, um, and if I'll just demonstrate that, that fan disappears. So that's the audio coming through, and I can adjust this down to zero, and effectively I've now got full volume on the audio amp nothing. Start to increase this just a little bit and we start to um, turn on the old audio out. So that's a that's a really good way of increasing the gain variation you can get out of, a, out of uh, in city this configuration with the um, dual gate MOSFET or uh, the Casco J310s. So it's really good because this, this variation here um, th this pot the swiper, which is providing what will be the AGC line, can go from zero, or ground, all the way through to uh, 10k 
in series with a to 15k so there's a voltage divider there so it can go to that point in the middle so uh, in other words by reducing that voltage on that second gate to below 2.7 and getting down now down to that approximately minus 3 volts which is the pinch off voltage for the J310 so um, what I in fact I don't have the bit of paper on my with me but it was it was you know it was just over if not close to 50 odd dB of gain variation um, that was subtly less if you only had three diodes and if you wanted five diodes and you got a little bit more so I just sort of decided to stick with four diodes um, I had to really crank up the old oscilloscope there to actually start to see uh, any output with the gain which will be the AGC line on minimum so anyway so um, that uh, that was good that was certainly um, quite interesting I'm, I'm going to do some experiments tonight when the sun goes down and uh, we'll have a look at um, 20 meters some real frequencies which I'll tack on to the end of uh, this video and we'll just see how sensitive this is um, I'm still toying with the idea of putting another amplifier in here another stage um, but we'll just have to see what I do once I've finished sort of playing around with this and sort of come up with a configuration that seems to work, uh, I can then draw up the circuit properly rather than just sort of my uh, scratchings and various calculations on the side. Do it up properly and we can put a video up on that. But um, no, it's uh, certainly for the test signals coming in, it seems to be working quite well. Um, and certainly pleased with that. Um, I can't see, even with quite a bit of um, power coming in, any ringing or anything ad adverse. Um, I had another look at this crystal filter this morning and really the construction technique which was pointed out um, is not really ideal for, for, for this. Um, with these tracks here there is a lot of inter-track capacitance which can cause certainly upset all these very small value capacitors and upset the overall characteristics of the filter. Um, what I did this morning is I had a look at that going oh yeah that's really not good at all so I sort of around the place tried to break the tracks up um, using a little drill piece uh, which I typically do anyway just to try and stop outputs from feeding back into inputs but for whatever reason I did not do that very well for that crystal filter um, but at the moment it seems to be working well uh, but a better way would be to build that sort of dead bug style or at least um, maybe I don't know cutting some copper board and doing it, doing it properly as opposed to what was there um, what else, what else, what else? I think it's pretty enough for now, so it's sort of been rambling a little bit. Apologies for that. Um, and what I'm sort of thinking about this radio at the end is it's going to be a good test bed, and what I want to do is sort of keep it for a while and then just start swapping in and out pieces. Because um, we know that RF amps are typically um, sources of noise and can, whoops, it is, sorry. Uh, um, can be sources of noise. Um, so I might play around with different sort of topologies for that particular amplifier there to minimise the introduction of um, too much noise into the circuit. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort, of, sort of quite keen. And then I can sort of swap out various modules and, and just play around to see what the overall effect is on the radio. So pretty enough for now. Uh, any questions please sing out. Um, what I'll do is I'll probably harden out and code those settings for the software into the, the final interface and we'll uh, upload that um, because it seems to work well and obviously put in the, the logic for 80 meters so it can be the dual band um, and we'll go from there. Anyway, 73s and uh, we'll talk to you soon. So we've got a French station there, 20 meters. Yeah, there's actually a, um, a 40 meter station. I've got the code such that if, if the uh, frequency is above 8 megahertz, it assumes upper side band, otherwise it's lower side band. So that filter doesn't sound too bad, actually. Yeah, there's another 
Yeah, another um, another local New Zealand ham there. Okay, so I'm to get a couple of stations now. We've probably got another um, half an hour until sunset, so probably just starting to come on to the grey line. So it's 14.2. So um, I won't I won't hold this video up any longer. What I certainly want to do now is um let me just turn that down is uh, put another stage of amplification after the crystal filter. So that's uh, that's going to be the next steps, uh, and then I'll just keep playing around. Um, but yeah, but all in all, uh, I think the settings now for the uh, the BFO and the uh, the VFO are about right. I did some more experiments um, after the video this morning. And I've pretty well decided that um, it's, it seems to work well when the part, the, the the desired sideband, either lower sideband for 80 or upper sideband for 20 meters, is passing through this filter um, when the beat frequency oscillator is on the lower edge. Um, so. What that basically means is for uh, 20 meter operation, I have the variable frequency on the high side of 20 meters, so it's frequency plus BFO, and then for 80 meters, I have it on the low side, so I have it, the BFO frequency, uh, which is um, 800300 or 8.03. Um, it's BFO minus the frequency, so um, that seems to be the best for placing, like I say, the, the, the sideband um, on the right side of going through that crystal filter. It just seems to sound better. The other, the other way is not too bad, but uh, it's just um, the preference here. So that's just been ad uh, adopted in the software. Um, so anything above 8 megahertz, um, which covers both uh, 80 and 40, uh, it's considered lower sideband, of course, and then from 20 meters above, it's upper sideband. So that's all done in the software. Um, and in fact, just before, I won't belabor the, the video, um, I was picking up quite happily some 40 meter um, signals quite well, and, and as well as down at uh, the 80 meters. Anyway, I'm going to knock it on the head there, and um, I think I might go and play around with uh, building up a, um, another um, amplify here and then having the output of that into that one and then we'll feed that into the, into the product detector and uh, we'll see how that works. Okay, cheers everyone, 73s.